Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the SwiftCase Productivity Podcast. My name is Adam Sykes, I'm the founder of SwiftCase, the professional productivity platform. And today with me we've got Craig, Alkis and Phil. Does everyone want to introduce themselves? Hi, I'm Craig, I'm a um, development manager of SwiftCase and I work at our Baltic Triangle office. Hi, I'm Alkis, I'm a senior developer of SwiftCase. Yeah, I'm uh, Phil, I'm just a developer also at the Baltic Triangle. I wouldn't call him just a developer, but he's uh, <laughs> so, yeah. so much more. <laughs> so much more, yeah. So today, uh, we were having a chat the other day, weren't we, Phil? And oh, yeah. you've been speaking to one of your friends over a couple, few weeks ago. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit more about Yeah, it was really interesting because it was a good example of um, how uh, workflows in any institution become a big problem when they get to a certain size yeah. or when a certain number of people are involved. And uh, it's quite a, a sort of very uh, contemporary issue that we talk about is the NHS yeah. um, and the IT systems of the NHS. And he's a, a, neuro, a neurologist, and might be a consultant neurologist down south, and he was exasperated with um, how there was so much uh, waste and redundant work within the workflow. And for example, the, the, the workflow he was talking about in, uh, particular was an imaging workflow so when a doctor requests a CAT scan yeah right, it would uh, they do their round and they say he needs a scan because he's broken his arm and it looks like there's a suspected fracture yeah. or something like that then the whole process of that scan taking place would go through three different apps or web apps innumerable people would actually have to observe this data, take it from the application, copy it into a spreadsheet, uh, copy it into an email. So not to the PDF. None of the apps talk to each other. No, no, the apps didn't talk to each other. If they did, um, only a certain amount of the information went through, okay. and they'd have to re-input the information that they'd put in in another of the apps. Mm. So it's a lot of time. And all the issues weren't necessarily entirely the fault of the apps and mm. the lack of communication between it. I think part of the issue was uh, delegation of uh, the tasks to people who didn't have the expertise as well. So, for instance, if the doctor uh, called for a, a scan, yeah. the, the person who entered the data for the request for the scan might be a ward clerk who doesn't know anything about the particular doctor yeah. who requested it. And he may, in the, our software, put it under uh, the wrong doctor. Yeah. Or, yeah. You know, he just puts it under, oh, they all just put it under the same. Uh, um, it would be like the emergency department consultant, and then I, that, that data yeah. isn't then pushed to it isn't correct. I found that uh, in the past um, when working with systems is, is sometimes a lot of uh, a lot of people. If you need, if there's a required set of data that's yeah, needed exactly. in order to yeah. move it on, if they don't have it but they need to yeah. get the job done, they'll just put anything in that's there exactly to make right, it work, yeah. Yeah. and that causes a nightmare down the line, doesn't yeah. it? So it makes it redundant that software. Yeah. Then, they have to do another filtering process manually. Mm. So it would get to a point then that those people would then, that's why they then copied into a spreadsheet because it was wrong, the doctor that it was associated with. Oh, wow. It was just associated with one particular doctor, even though there was multiple scans yeah. ordered by different doctors. Mm. So they then have to then manually sort it and then copy their relevant uh, Excel rows yeah. and put them in an email, email to someone. Yeah. And then that doctor would then have to, then the radiologist would have to make sense of it that put input their data into the app, that would go back, they'd then have to copy and paste that data, like just too much, yeah. The various different people are yeah. making more work for exactly. themselves yeah. based on the inefficiency of the, yeah. the current system, really. They're not quite implementing automation, sorry, yeah. properly, like, as it's defined. Yeah. Or as it was defined when they originally came with the workflow. So the problem is, with such a large workflow, and staff changed so much, I'm sure people come in and go, oh, we, don't, we can't do it that way. But they're not going to go back to the developer and ask them to change it. They'll just find a way to make it work yeah. in the yeah. current system. Yeah. So I suppose that's the trouble when you get to a large organization. It's not flexible, is it? You know, yeah. So you know, in a small organization, you find a new way. You can implement the process straight away. Exactly. And you know, so, some bigger organization, organizations manage it. So like sort of car manufacturers, especially in 
in Japan, I think Toyota, oh, they always had that, that process of continual improvement and if anyone in the factory thought of something that would improve something, they'd try it, test it out and move forward. But I think you know, some, some public sector uh, bodies certainly are very risk averse to trying things in case something goes wrong. Mm. You know, you know, if we try something different, will it work out? The stakes are higher, aren't they? Yes, they are. Yeah, life and death, and you know, it certainly is life and death, isn't it? With the with the NHS as compared to building a car, that you know, maybe they're not as you know open to tweaking and testing and being flexible. Well, one thing I've noticed is there's a few trusts now really driving (coughs) for innovative technologies, and they've actually opened up innovation centers. Yeah, and they're accepting like students who come in and propose solutions. For example, a friend of mine is proposing a diabetes app for them. Okay. So there is this sort of drive. Yeah. It's just not at all it's trusts. Not mm, yeah, so yeah, it's, exactly. it's kind of a slow movement right now. So although the NHS is a big organization, mm-hmm. it's lots of separate silos, isn't it? I suppose in yeah. different departments, different trusts are doing things differently, aren't they? Because I think, yeah, I, I saw something the other day and it was like a competition for APIs. It was another trust down south and they'd opened up an API and said, well, what tools can people suggest to use this API? And it was all health-based. Um, and it's you know just basically opening up to the to the world, basically to the crowd, as opposed to 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 find solutions that way. But yeah, it was a one small area. It wasn't widespread. Exactly. It wasn't. It's almost, it's almost crowd <coughs> sourcing a solution. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah. Well, I suppose it's interesting when you get to large organisations, people move around as well. So you'd expect some kind of consistency because if a doctor moves from one hospital to another, mm-hmm. then we've got a whole different workflow. It doesn't seem to make sense, does it? I mean, it should be mm-hmm. consistent. It should be the best, you know, an optimized workflow for the NHS, yeah. I suppose. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's such a big task. Yeah. And in the past, large scale IT projects in the NHS, they've had the funding, but they've, yeah. they've failed. Do you yeah. know, they've gone Do you think they're massively like, over budget. And it's like once been twice shy. Perhaps, of, yeah. I mean, yeah. an overall. Yeah. And also, I suppose, in the context of now where you know public services are struggling, yeah. you know, due to finances and mm. you know aging populations and whatever else, you know, is IT what people want to spend money on, or yeah, is exactly. it yeah. is it medicine? Yeah, especially if you're a manager and there, you're weighing up the yeah. choice between purchasing another CAT scanner, yeah, which would be you know tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands, <coughs> versus a slightly faster optimized system. Yeah. That, as to the doctors and everyone else probably wouldn't actually improve the process. Well, I suppose if you've been stung before as well, like yeah. the NHS experienced a couple of years ago with the, the hacking um, um, issue, you know, I suppose there's a, I don't know, you might be quite cautious yeah. or opt-in for a new solution. Yeah, it feels like it's not mature, yeah. like, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it goes back to that whole thing, doesn't it, where the stakes are higher for something yeah. like the NHS. But then really. you get into the risk, don't you? I mean, thought, this isn't just the NHS, I mean, seen it in councils as well where they were using software that was so out of date they had to actually pay for extensions for support directly to microsoft yeah Yeah. because they wanted they were so risk averse they didn't want to upgrade that they were that far behind that the the security flaws were opened up and it probably turned out it was it was actually a lot more expensive to get the support directly from microsoft yeah yeah, and then implementing a new system. Yeah, but then they still use beepers, don't they, in hospitals? Yeah, so fax machines. Fax yeah, exactly. Machines too, yeah. yeah, they're not allowed to buy anymore, apparently. No. And they're trying to, and it was like the company that maintained the beepers, they pay like thirty-two million pounds or something to to keep yeah. something like a hundred beepers going. I can't. Remember. I mean, that's probably an exaggeration. Yeah, um, but legacy software has cost, yeah. doesn't it? Because the developers and the people who manage it yeah. start disappearing, so then supply and demand it raises yeah. costs. So it might be. In theory, secure mm. because it's not new and there's no, you know, no bugs are coming into it. But is it compatible with newer hardware? Or mm. Is it open to risks if it's not up to date? Mm. I think you know you were working for the NHS when you were around the yeah. sort of the big issue they had around security around. Actually, so I, I worked the, during the time they got hacked with that. I think it was called WannaCry. Yeah, and, that's it. Yeah, and actually, all that was was uh, a few days or weeks prior to the hack, there was a Microsoft update and there was a patch. So if you install the update, you will save, yeah. which is actually what they did in my trust. Yeah. So it's it's a whole, you know, you got to keep your software up to date. There's a well. training it's, issue there, isn't there? Yeah, really? exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's not even, the IT department really should be on top of this type of stuff. Yeah. And yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. But it's a culture of being up to date, isn't it? Security is like a culture, like a system and people like in a business or in a, in a public sector thing. You either have got that culture about you change your passwords, you keep your desk tidy, you know, basic stuff. You keep your software up to date, you don't install stuff, or you don't. And I think if you've not got people who are experts, you know, it's a large organization, you know, your IT guys may not see a system for months at a time. You've got a proper systems in place to keep control of these, you've got a proper audit in place, haven't you? And I think, you know, if you've got the more software you've got, the more security risk you've got because you've got exactly. a bigger register yeah. of everything yeah. that you've, <clears throat> you've got there. It could just be one piece of software that is absolutely essential yep. that is incompatible with the latest yep. security update or yep. operating system updates. And so you can't install yeah. it. I mean, yeah. I have, we've had that with Alan sometimes that our IDE isn't compatible or yep. whatever I've got to get my monitor, their monitor up, yep. that hack or whatever yep. isn't compatible with the latest operating system, so yeah. I'm more vulnerable. Yeah. 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 yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, I think one of the other areas that we're sort of interested around this is, I suppose, it's very, very similar to the way businesses would operate as well. Is like we were going back to what you said before, they've got to weigh up the, the cost of the optimization versus the yeah. cost of the, the, the medicine. But I suppose you've got to think of it's not just really like it's the future opportunity cost that you're losing out on. If you don't take the optimization route, which could actually save you money. You, yeah. you could in the future be restricting your, your ability to you know access other medicines because well if you save yeah you might be saving thousand pounds or you know ten million pounds today but are you saving you know hundred million in the future or whatever exactly. it is in the yeah. future because you've taken mm -hmm. that you've invested in something I suppose that's the sort of thing business businesses would look at you know as a cost benefit analysis. Also, like future costs. Yeah. yeah. With the NHS, they've also got the, the public um, assessment of that choice yeah. as well. So, yeah. You know, with a private business, you can make that decision, and no one's really going to care if you yeah. get lost, even. You know. Yeah. But um, with the NHS, I mean, I saw workflow optimization managers are being appointed in certain trusts and GPs trusts, and they would then spend maybe sort of twenty hours a week mm. optimizing, so that doctors wouldn't have to, let, you know. Deal with a hundred uh, letters being sent out. You mm. have to write a template, say, or something yeah. like that. Now, as soon as I read an article on that, mm. at the very bottom of the article was a comment saying, "I've just calculated the cost to the NHS of this worker optimization person, mm. and I think that's a ridiculous cost." Mm. He said, "You know," and um, so making those choices that are speculative about future opportunity cost. Yeah. Is a gamble, but is it speculative though? I suppose is it, you know, is it, if you know that you can save someone an yeah. hour a day or two yeah. hours a day, that's true. Well, yeah, it's, it's not speculative, it's not is it? It's, yeah. it's a definite yeah. guarantee. Yeah. And I suppose yeah. it's how you yeah. sell that to the public, isn't yeah. it? I suppose it's the well, you've, got, the, you've to got to sell, sell it. it to the yeah. public. That's part of it. Every yeah. decision you make has to be sold. Yeah, and so that you become anxious and sort of, I can see how you would just sort of become constricted by this idea that oh, that won't be received well. Yeah, yeah, which is private and I don't think you have. But I can see your point, but I think a lot of decisions that doctors and you know certain yeah. tested doctors, but trust would take would be pretty much behind closed doors, wouldn't they? They're not really the, the day to day stuff's not yeah. transparent unless they start sort of take like you know millions, multi millions, billions pound decisions. That's true. You know, I think and is it is it a case that little organisations could uh, produce systems and develop systems, improve workflows that as long as they they will work into a common uh, infrastructure, like you say APIs or whatever. As long as there was a common interface between these systems, mm -hmm. then, yeah. then they would lose. They, you know, maybe that was the issue in the first place. If you try and get one big system yeah, and it, replace yeah. everything in one go, mm -hmm. you know, we know we don't we don't do that in our business. You've got to start, you've got to start from the basics, yeah. really, or at least one particular part, and just see how it works. Because it's one of those where you don't actually know. How it's going to work until you use it sometimes, yeah, exactly. yeah. and you can over plan things, yeah. um, which I find, and that's that's just a nightmare because you get stuck in this logistical hell. So yeah, painting um, the fourth bridge, isn't it? You start at painting it, by the yeah. time you get to the end, you got to start again. Yeah, yeah, especially when there's too many cooks as well. Yeah. You know, it, you can kind of get stuck in the planning stages forever, and then suddenly the money's just gone down the drain. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so definitely. And it's having the difference, isn't it? It's the difference between having something that's designed by committee, 
which is obviously an issue because you don't get anywhere. Mm. And the opposite, well, another way that's, that's equally as wrong is having someone who's not actually spoken to anyone mm. yeah. and like found out how people work and like looked at how they work and try and Got off on take, a take yeah. people along with the change. Because yeah. you've got to bring the people who are involved along mm. with the change. Because otherwise, if they don't see the benefit of doing what they're doing, they don't. They'll put in that same doctor's name every time, yeah, exactly. right? Maybe because that's for it. them, yeah. their job is to just get sh- make sure that that yeah. scan happens. Yeah. As long as they put in a doctor, that scan happens. Their job's done. Yeah. They don't realise that down the line, maybe that that's causing an issue because that's yeah. that's gone past their sort of realm of responsibility. Well, there was a recent story about doctors using WhatsApp for that same the same reason yeah. because there was traditionally they would have to ring someone yeah. and get hold, you know get hold of it. Whereas they could just WhatsApp, send them the scan to yeah. the radiologist. I need this, yeah. and circumvent those processes because yeah. there wasn't a, a process in. Yeah. And they did it to save lives. But what they didn't realise was that they were compromising safety data, yeah. um, patients' data yeah. safety because yeah. there was a lot of loss of anonymity. Yeah, and you start getting an ethical question, yeah. privacy questions, yeah. don't you? That if you've you know the system's been built to be compliant, if you start circumventing like what's been yeah. put in in place, you know you can obviously run into issues that you know from your workflow as well. Yeah. You found that, you kind of found that doctors had a certain attitude towards software. Yeah, well one of my roles is to actually build software directly for departments. So I'd have to go to them and basically tell them how to use it and oh, whatnot. Wow. Yeah. But there's a real difficulty because there's quite a especially with the more senior doctors mm-hmm. who have been doing these workflows and processes mm-hmm. for years, they're quite stubborn in a sense to yeah. change it because they believe what they're doing is the most efficient which is true for them mm. but it's not to say that it can't be more efficient or just as efficient if we implement maybe a you know a software that can you know essentially automate their workflows yeah, yeah. so I suppose there's two points there the first one is we hear this a lot isn't it that's that's the way we've always done it yeah, so yeah. that's how we want to do it which yeah. is that you know the first thing you need to break people out of I suppose the other thing that you mentioned is it, it might be the most efficient for them, but is it the efficient for the whole? Mm-hmm. And obviously you've got to weigh up the consultants maybe what cost more than exactly. you know, a clerk yeah. or whatever, but is the overall process costing more because someone's not doing like if the clerk's not putting in the right order, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. this clerk's getting a lot of blame. I'm not sure if the system's yeah, yeah. the clerk. But yeah. you know, if they're not putting in that one bit, that causes a lot of problem for doctors who would maybe cost more or do cost more. And you know, it leads to bigger issues later on. And overall, their process might be nice and efficient because they're in really click that, that, that's the thing. It's but everything within their scope yeah. works fine, but yeah, outside but of over it, it's, yeah. a, it's a mess. So I think, yeah, I think we've co- we covered quite a few different areas there, didn't we? So I think one thing is it's not an easy, you know, it's not an easy answer that's going to sort this. But I mean, I, I think one thing though is uh, just harping back onto the um, the whole idea of putting in the wrong data in order to move it on. I think the staff who are responsible for inputting that data, I think there needs to be more communication between them and whoever's in charge of putting that system together. Um, Because, I mean, we we found it in the past when we've dealt with things like this. It's usually quite a quick change from changing something from being required to not being required or changing the type of data that goes in there. Um, you can put some notes on, yeah, you know, like some guidance around it. You know, yeah, don't just give a box where someone's got to type something in. Give them a suggestion about what should be in here. But yeah, yeah I, I think mean, it's all like it's all like key points, isn't it? I think that the main thing is, like I said, there's not going to be an easy answer, is yeah. to this? There's there's lots of things that really uh, maybe the solution is to have separate systems and get them all to talk to each mm-hmm. other. Maybe that's a way forward. But I think you know, like I said. It's something that does need to be looked at because with increasing pressures, you know, reducing resources, increasing number of people living longer, you know, this isn't a problem that's going to go away. And hopefully, if we can, technology can play its part in helping things. So, yeah, yeah I think it's been a good yeah. discussion. So, yeah, thanks everybody for joining us for the Swift Case Productivity Podcast. And hopefully, you'll see us next time. And if you want to follow us on social media, you can find us at Swift Case UK on Twitter. Um, we're all on LinkedIn. It's uh, Adam Sykes, Craig McCarthy, Alcas Petru, and Phil Whitby. <laughs> Nearly forgot the name there, Phil. Um, Just to develop. <laughs> and uh, visit our website for more information if you want to find out about Swift Case. It's swiftcase.co.uk.
Oh yeah, if you've got any comments or any suggestions about what else uh, you want us to talk about, uh, please add a comment below. Yeah, and if any comments about how you think we can make the NHS or other public services more efficient, then throw those in too and we'll catch up there. Great. Thanks everyone. See you next time. Bye. Bye.